Hello, and welcome to Broads and Books. I'm Erin. And I'm Amy. And this is episode number 89, Sin Wagon. Riding around on a sin wagon. I have to tell you, I've never heard this song before you brought this idea to the table. It's a song by the Chicks, Mm -hmm. formerly known as the Dixie Chicks. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it's, if you haven't heard it, you should pause. something. Yeah, pause right now. Go listen. We provided the link in the show notes. Yes. Go watch. There's there's a lot happening. In so this much song. happening. Yeah. So much happening. It's catchy. It is. You're gonna be singing it, <laughs> and you're gonna be thinking about all the things you could do on your own personal sin wagon. Well, and then I just was thinking of like the wagon you might have as a kids, and you're just carrying your sins around. Yeah. Like, oh my mag- my wagon's got a lot. Yes. But we're using this this week as a theme of hypocrisy. Mm-hmm. Of how people love to point out other people's sin wagons. You know it. But pay no attention to the truck. No, I'm going to hide. I'm going to hide my sin wagon. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm going to ride on yours and be like, this is all bad. All bad. I love this theme because it is rife for discussion, for pop yes. culture, for books. So much. There's a lot going on. There is a lot in this So one. well done. Well done choosing, Aaron. Thank you. Hmm. Thank you to the chicks for quite the catchy <laughs> tune. As we know, the chicks listen religiously to us. Yes. So they've been waiting for this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. One and of my sins on my sin wagon is bravado. <laughs> <laughs> Masking a deep imposter syndrome. Yes. 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 Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. 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 Exactly. Aaron, I got a question for you. Mm-hmm. So we've been hearing a lot, maybe last year, mm-hmm. maybe last six months for a while, mm-hmm. about something called cancel culture. Mm-hmm. And I think we probably have some feelings about cancel culture and how it's being used. But do you think it's really just outing some damn hypocrites? Yes, but in the reverse. Mm. I think that actually the whole movement of cancel culture in and of itself is hypocritical. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's there's people come down on all sides. I'm not saying that the things that people are getting called out for are okay. But I'm also not saying that that means that we just cancel someone. Oh, yeah. It's over. Everything you did is terrible. We're over it. Um, I don't necessarily think that that's the way that we should be moving forward either. But I think the movement itself is hypocritical by nature. You're purposely looking for something that's bad in some cases. Like mm-hmm. there's people, there's examples of people that were maybe doing something for charity and people felt the need to like find something terrible out or there are people that are bad actors you know doing things out in public that they shouldn't be doing and shouldn't be said that they get called out on but I also question the person that's so happy behind their keyboard to bring all of this not attention to it it's not necessarily just the attention to things that we need to correct but like the everything has to be terrible about this person they can never be you know alive again basically Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so i have i have a real problem with that Mm -hmm. i don't feel like hypocrites necessarily need to be outed in that way number one and number two i think it's hypocritical to out other people Mm -hmm. as hypocrites so how do you feel about it (laughs) well right in this moment when ziggy is pulling down my broads Mm -hmm. and books branded hoogie 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 Hoogie. Also known as a hoodie. Yeah, Mm -hmm. also known as a hoodie. I'm feeling okay about it. I do think there's a difference, though, between like cancel culture where to me it feels more like the actions of like people from the book that you mentioned. So you've been publicly shamed. I couldn't remember that. Uh Where people feel emboldened to call out some people for minor transgressions. Yes. Then I think there's just straight up accountability where someone is bringing up valid, valid things. Yes. Such as Matt Gates sex trafficking. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Uh, Versus, yes, something that you're just getting canceled for. Right. No, I think people need accountability, especially when your transgressions are pretty damn big. Yes. When you've got a wagon full Mm -hmm. of sins that you are um, accusing other people of. Mm -hmm. When, let's say, a lot of your um, followers believe that there's a child sex trafficking ring in a pizza restaurant. Mm -hmm. When actually one of the representatives is just paying for sex via Venmo. Right. Yeah. There's that. There is that. And then try to say, I believe that actually it was the DOJ that was setting him up. Mm -hmm, That's mm -hmm. what was his first line of defense, Mm -hmm. which I mean, kudos for being that. Speaking of bravado. Yeah. I mean, no one thought that through that that was going to be easy to prove. I mean, (laughs) what? I always there two weeks ago. I haven't seen SNL from last night yet. I haven't either. Okay, so two weeks ago, Colin Jost said something to the effect of like, you know, you 
this whole thing sounds about right, especially because of your vibe. And I'm like, it's true. Yeah. You got a vibe. It's the vibe. You got yeah. a vibe of paying yeah. for sex via Venmo and then blaming it on cancel culture. Mm-hmm. And I agree with you. I think that I, and I think I, that's part of it is I don't like the phrase cancel culture. Yes. And I don't like the idea that behind it, which is just, oh, you made a mistake. You're done. Mm-hmm. I, I think I like better the idea of accountability. Yes. Like you do need to take accountability when you make mistakes and you do need to work on those things or figure out what you're not understanding. We've talked a lot about that over the last year. But this idea that, A, someone doesn't get that opportunity, Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that we're doing anyone justice to say there's no way to grow or learn. Because then what are we expecting of anyone? Absolutely. So how does anything change? If no one's allowed to grow and learn, how does anything change? Right. And there, like you said, there's differences. There's differences between between using offensive language and sex trafficking someone. Yes. Like there's, and those two things should not be confused, but somehow there's... Somehow they've been put on equal plane. Yeah. And, and it's and yeah. it's hypocritical of the people that are now using cancel cultures like, see, I'm just a victim of cancel culture. Yes. Well, no. Or saying no. I've been silenced by cancel culture. And meanwhile, you just got a book deal and a show on Newsmax. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So. Did he? Is that? Right? I don't think he did, but somebody, somebody did. Somebody else did? Oh, God. Yeah. Oof. There's just so many. Yeah. So many terrible people in the world, Aaron. So, so many. many hypocrites. That's why this theme yes. is a good one. It is a good one. Yeah. It's a great one. Mm-hmm. So is there something that you were adamant about when you were younger that now would seem hypocritical to you? Because, I mean, hypocrisy, we're, we're all kind of guilty of it. At we're totally points, right? all hypocritical. Yeah. yeah. And I think you're right that a big part of it is learning and growing. Mm-hmm. And when I was younger, and I think you and I have talked about this a number of times, but I would like differentiate myself from other women. I'm not that high maintenance girl. Uh, I'm not that like mm. hot mess over there. Like I'm better because I can hang out with the guys and uh, I don't get offended and yeah. I don't get embarrassed embarrassed and woo all that Mm -hmm. kind of stuff where really I was just falling prey to like how society pits us against each other you know Mm -hmm. and so I think that that was something that I really kind of felt strongly about when I was younger which was a bunch of hypocrisy yeah and now I've learned I've grown I've read so much more Mm -hmm. and yeah so things have changed yeah but that's a great example of learning more I don't want to say doing the work because that keeps getting yeah, said keeps all the time said, and yeah. I hate it. It's yeah. like taking a journey, doing the work, <laughs> taking a journey. I've taken a journey through discovering I do have emotions and it's okay to show them. Yes. And, you know, for a while I'd be like, nope, showing Shut emotion. it down. Showing Shut emotions it down. is female. Yeah. I don't want to be a female. Right. Yes. No. Instead, I'm going to shut myself down like a toxic man. Showing he- emotions is just human. Yeah, it doesn't that's been a new recollection or yeah. a new realization for me? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You don't need to cancel culture your feelings. <laughs> Sometimes I wish I could. I wish well, I could just shut it back down. <laughs> Not yours. I meant mine too. That sounded bad. I meant like mine personally as well. Are you trying to shut my, yeah. down my emotions? Shut them down, Amy. <laughs> too it. much. Yeah, canceling you. Yes. Mm-hmm. I got another question for you. Okay. Okay, you've got children. I do. You have four children. I do. Two of them young. Uh huh. If those children, mm-hmm. pick any of them, pick all of them. If they were asked mm-hmm. what you were hypocritical about, mm-hmm. what would they say? <laughs> they would say fiscal responsibility. <laughs> and here's why <laughs> it's one specific thing. Because I, I'm adamant about this. We talk about it. We have helped our older ones create budgets, save money, do things like that. I'm that way about. I mean, I'm working on it with the younger ones, but I will buy a book without ever thinking about mm-hmm. checking my bank account. Mm-hmm. Doesn't matter. I'll buy it. Mm-hmm. And they know it because they see them all come in the mail. <laughs> I have the evidence in a big library. Look at the boxes, mom. Mm-hmm. Look at the boxes. Yeah. Yeah. And I pay no attention to that and mm-hmm. I don't care. And I've just made it a budget item and that's where I'm at. So yeah. I, they would laugh and say that. That, yeah. I mean, on the scale of hypocrisy, that's, that's all I right. I feel like that's not terrible, right? And you're still showing a good lesson that, hey books are important yes yes and you might bankrupt yourself because of yes. books but that's okay and you know what when we talk about fiscal responsibility with them we tell them you need to be aware of the things that you're passionate that's about good point. like yeah. zach has kind of gotten into clothes and shoes so he makes himself like this is how much i will spend on that mm-hmm. in this amount of time and like i won't go about around that which yeah. that's good like you're learning yeah i don't even do that with book they don't know that but i don't ever <laughs> stick 
<laughs> I don't ever stick to that line item. Ever. I hope your children have stopped listening to the podcast at this point. Yeah. Like they did a long time ago, right? Yeah. They were just like, yeah, whatever, mom. Yeah, yeah. I think so. I mm-hmm. hope so. I hope so. Well, yeah. you've just added yourself, if not. Also, can you be my mom? Because I still don't have that fiscal responsibility. <laughs> <laughs> Never quite learned that. <laughs> I know. I, I've struck. Yeah. And that's one, like, if people saw me when I was younger, they'd be like, no way. You're yeah. Not, that's not a thing for you. Yeah. I think it ruined it that Pizza Hut rewarded buying books and, and reading yeah. with free pizzas. Yeah. Because then yeah. I was just like, well, I'm going to read all the books. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And there, I just, there's certain things I won't wait for. That's another thing. That's kind of another lesson I've tried to teach them is like, oh, you know, the instant gratification, but I'm telling you, there's certain books, new release day. I need it now. I and need instant it. gratification. It's my money and I need it now. It's gratification. <laughs> yeah. It is gratifying to get those books. So gratifying. <sighs> Getting that on the day that it I just, I can't. Yeah. I can't. It's too exciting. Yeah. I get too excited. <laughs> okay. So my children would say I'm hypocritical about this. What would the podcast say that uh, you're hypocritical First about? off, don't align them with children. They're not for No, babies. they're not. Okay. No, they're not. All right. No, 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 no. I Again, was just I'm more go meaning with like... people. People. I just called them people. <laughs> I just more meant creatures that are around. No, you're right. That you're right. could point out your hypocrisy. They are in no way children. You Thank did you. not bird them. I know. You're not responsible for their long-term adult behavior. <laughs> you are not in any way connected to them via DNA. That's good. And there's or still, papers that are in a, you know, courtroom. They're still running my life yeah. as if they were. But yes, I think that they would call out the inside versus outside divide. Because <laughs> <laughs> the inside cats, that we get a certain kind of food and they get a certain kind of uh, dinner at a certain time. The outside cats, because there's a couple of feral cats that mm-hmm. I'm feeding and I was mm-hmm. feeding them through the winter. Um, they get food at different times and they get different food. And Ziggy, in particular, looks at that and be like, he doesn't understand that it's the cheapest food you can buy. It's not good. Right. It's only because the ferals are otherwise going to eat dirt. Right. So he looks at that and he's like, what the hell? Mm-hmm. Why would you give them that? Why are you giving the outside cats mm. this delicacy, obviously, obviously, that we're not getting? Yeah. Why? I also think they look outside and see different rules because those cats are pissing anywhere they want. That's true. They're scratching on trees. They are. They're running amok, really. Yeah. So I think, yeah, they would see there is a class divide and it is hypocritical. And I try to tell them, listen, one of those cats is your deadbeat dad. And I'm trying to help him out. Karma. Consequences. (laughs) That's what I'm trying for here. Also, you're on the good side of the class divide. Exactly. Like I brought you in, buddy. Yeah. Be grateful. Yes. Some gratitude. Which maybe he needs to start a gratitude journal. <laughs> just three things every day. <laughs> All he would do is just eat the journal. He yeah. would start tearing out the paper. I'm and happy like, I have this paper <laughs> to shred and put everywhere. <laughs> and also he would probably fill it with musings about his deadbeat dad and how oh. he treated him wrong. Yeah. That's not true. And he looks at the deadbeat dad yeah. and he's like, whatever, man. This worked out for me. This worked out for me. Yeah. Thanks for pretending to be my deadbeat dad so I could get in this house. <laughs> That's true. I'm making an assumption that yeah. may not also, be Also, Mom, thanks for pretending to be dead in the road. Yeah. That really helped. <laughs> that really put her over the edge. <laughs> it's true because I look at the cat and I'm like, buddy, you if your nothing. mom was here. Yeah. So I'm going to bring you in. Yep. Mm-hmm. So. so I guess we're just hypocrites, Aaron. Yeah, well, that's what this week's about. That's Hypocrites. what this week's about, yeah. I have got a fiction pick that is wild. Ooh. And it's, a, 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 I think, a terrific example of okay. this. This is a book that came out last year. It's from Unnamed Press, which we Ooh, yes. have started Very to really nice. dig. Yeah. By Chelsea G. Summers. It's called A Certain Hunger. Oh. So, Dorothy is a food critic Mm -hmm. she is very good at what she does and she's also an excellent cook herself like she has learned all of these techniques she even thinks about food she thinks in food like it is just part of who she is Mm -hmm. she also has lots of sex and in fact we meet her on a night when she picks up a random dude at a hotel bar and they keep having fun they have fun that night they keep having fun for a few weeks until one night she invites him to a home like a vacation home out on Fire Island, and kills him with an ice pick. As you do. But not just that. She slices off pieces of his flesh Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and later whips up a super fancy dish with that flesh and eats it. Mm -hmm. 
So if you're thinking I'm talking about cannibalism, you are indeed correct. You are correct. Fancy ass Mm -hmm. cannibalism. So this story, she's narrating from prison because they figure it out at some point. But she goes back to describes like her seemingly sort of ideal childhood where food was so important. Um, they, They made food as a family like it was food was gorgeous it was important it talks or she talks about her career and especially she was coming up in the crazy print media days of the 80s and 90s and becoming a food critic and we talk through her many love affairs and we see this is not the first time she's killed nor is it the first time she's eaten the dudes that she killed what's wonderful Though she is very self-aware. She knows that she is different. She knows maybe even she could be called a psychopath. (laughs) Maybe, I mean. (laughs) Maybe. But she also knows that guys get away with far worse. So she takes a sort of pleasure in upending gender expectations in Mm. her career, in her hobbies. She also knows that generally just we as people are deeply hypocritical, especially when it comes to food. Mm -hmm. And that's why I chose it for this theme. As a food critic, she knows how food is made. She knows where the sausage comes from. She knows the violence and cruelty behind some of the best food Mm -hmm. at factory farms, at small butchers, wherever you're going. She also knows that in the kitchens where some of the best food is created is a lot of dudes that are very mean and it's very over masculine. Like it is just full of hypocrisy. Mm -hmm. And we're all okay with this because the food tastes good. And the restaurant makes us feel fancy, makes us feel special. But kill a human with that same violence and eat that meat and it's a sin and it's horrifying and it's repugnant. And I love that. I love that the book goes there. I love that this character goes there. The writing is spectacular. It is so visceral. In some ways, it reminded me of when I read that memoir from the chef, Ileana Regan. Yeah. Who was not, by the way, talking about cannibalism, just so we're clear. Yeah. (laughs) She was talking about Mm -hmm. just this love and beauty of food. And what's crazy is that it translates here. Mm -hmm. And it talks about like food you would know, but also um, people. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I liked also that this character is an older woman, which is zero Fs to give Mm -hmm. about life. I liked that it laid bare so many hypocritical aspects of society and especially in this world of food. Mm -hmm. And can I say that I love Unnamed Press? Yeah, they're great. Because I've been reading some of their recent releases and it's just filled with these sort of Uh, voices from feral women in a way like Mm -hmm. it's just you never see anything like this anywhere else so I'm really enjoying that a lot and yeah well I read this too oh you did I did oh my gosh and I what I wanted to and you just let me go on without saying that that's all right all right um but I will say too if this is sounding like oh I couldn't read that I had that worry too at first because I thought oh man am I gonna because I can get kind of like you know what? My kids Gross throw up. up, blood, none of that bothers me. But sometimes food stuff can bother me. Mm-hmm. But I didn't have that feeling at all. Did you have that feeling? No, ever? and I'm a okay. vegan. And yeah, so I was, yeah, a, you know, what... I'm, I don't, I get kind of grossed out when we're talking yeah. about just, you know, cow meat. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, there's human meat. Yeah. Here. But I liked that they're like coming to it as a vegan. It almost made me feel like, yeah, yeah, you're effing right. Like yeah, this is, yeah. <laughs> this is hypocritical. And, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you don't get, I mean, it sounds like you're talking about a uh, topic, but mm-hmm. it, it, the way it's written is just something else. Yeah. Just the whole idea. Yeah. It's terrific. It's terrific. So good. What else? Um, so you read the book. What else yeah. uh, would you say about it that I missed? Um, I think you pretty much covered what I was going to add that just that like that was my initial feeling was mm-hmm. like, oh, I don't, you know, don't get creeped out if you think because it's worth it. It's worth the read. It is. And, the, and that character, like I've yes. never seen anyone like yes. her and yes. I loved it. Yes. And that's, I think, maybe a good point, too, is that um, as avid readers and as you get further in your reading life, sometimes you're craving something totally different. Mm. And when something comes up like that, you're like, oh, my gosh. Yeah. That was amazing. Yes. And it was. It was out of left field and it just felt different the character felt different the writing obviously the subject matter it was a delight yeah it was a delight Mm -hmm. and yeah it I kind of want um yeah I just want everyone to read it yeah you Mm -hmm. should my the book that I picked this week this one we got an advanced copy of because you know we're awesome because we're legit and we have a website we have a website (laughs) 
which is the definition of legit. And then I think we got double legit what? when people say, like, here's a book. But, you know, thinking about, you were talking about book mail earlier. It's yeah. even better when you get unexpected book mail. Yes. It's yes. like, oh my God, people are sending me books. Yeah, that's the And best we're getting thing some of that, and it's wonderful. In the world. Yeah. Yes. So this, it's actually supposed to be published in June of 2021, but it's called God Spare the Girls mm. by Kelsey McKinney. So, like I said, June 2021, Luke Nolan has led the Hope Congregation in Northern Texas for over a decade. Oh, we're getting into religion. I like it. And he is that preacher. Oh, boy. You know what I mean. I do know what you mean. He's handsome. He's charismatic. He's obsessed with image. Mm Mm-hmm. And maybe not so much with living the embodiment of the scripture that he preaches every Sunday. Imagine that. Weird, right? Yeah. Tale as old as time. (laughs) So he has two daughters, Abigail and Caroline. And Abigail lives up to every ounce of her role as a preacher's daughter. She sings. She writes music. She is about it. Um, She is getting married in this summer that we're encountering them. Now, her younger sister, Caroline, is just graduating, getting ready to go off to college. She's got some doubts. She's like, I don't really think that this facade that we portray is really like the whole ideology. I'm not sure. She's trying to figure out what does that mean for her faith. Um, She made this decision to leave and go um, to a college farther away, and that was kind of a battle. So they're both kind of at these different points in their lives, getting ready to take off. And it's at that point that it comes out, spoiler, Dad's having an affair. What? What? Didn't see that coming. (laughs) That is shocking. Shocking. Brand new information. So everything that they thought, obviously, that was important, you know, doesn't seem that important anymore. And like I said, on the surface, this book could seem like the same old tale, right? We're used to kind of seeing people that hold themselves up to kind of be torn down. I mean, we kind of love that kind of story, Mm -hmm. right? But this is different while you have the hypocritical preacher whose sins are laid bare Mm -hmm. for the church that he loves and everybody finds out he's not who he says he is, but oh, they're going to forgive him. And looking at you, Joel Osteen. I was trying to remember his name. All I kept thinking of was the dong account. The (laughs) dong Osteen. (laughs) I couldn't remember his actual name. Joel Osteen. Yep. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But this book has uh, like more to offer than that. It really is like a whole nother layer about belief, faith, And the role that women actually play in the church, Mm. and especially in a modern church. Mm -hmm. So I think that because the writer did such an amazing job with these characters, like I fell in love with the daughter Caroline. Like she's just, you can tell she's young, you know, she's getting ready to go off to college, but the thoughts that she's having, the things that she's pointing out are pure. You know, they don't come from any other place than just trying to understand the world. Like that doesn't make sense with what you've taught me that doesn't jive like so how do I how does my faith fit into what I really feel or I'm a female so how does that work I think that that could be a topic that could be very hard to write effectively Mm -hmm. and very hard to handle in a way that people could see as still maybe respectful because I think that you could read this book whether you are um, very religious or not very religious and get something out of it both ways Mm. Um, I obviously I picked it because I mean, all faith's a little bit hypocritical, right? Yes. And yes, it is. In this book, I really think the question sort of becomes, is there something to strive for that's different than perfection? Is Ooh. perfection the only thing that's important? Or is there something else that should actually be serviced by yeah. preachers and church and faith and the role of religion? Like, mm-hmm. what, is, what are we actually saying it is? And through these girls and their relationship and the relationship with their parents, as that comes out over the summer and... There's so many different layers of that and so many ways that that's explored. And it's really interesting. It's a great backdrop of a story. I think it's really well written. And I think everyone will like it when it comes out in June of and this year. You know what you can do with books that aren't out yet is you can pre order them. Pre-order so them. this one, you can pre order that bad boy and get it like the day. The it comes day. In, like we out. were just saying, book mail. Yeah. You get it. You're like, oh, boom, day out. It's mine. <laughs> it is mine. And I can start reading it right now. I want it to make a sound effect like that I when it too. arrives. Boom! Yeah. Like it kind of pops like one of those poppers on New Year's Eve. Yeah. Confetti everywhere. Although I say that and then I, I jump so much. I just I do So too. that may not be a good idea. Or I might pee myself or something. Well, maybe and that's we could no come good. up with something else. Because it would yeah. be nice to commemorate that. Because I don't know about you, but I get so excited. And there's no one so else excited. in my house that really understands that no. level. And so it would be nice to just have the box celebrate with me. It would. Like you're right. This is great. Maybe like a disco tune when you open it. (laughs) 
I do like when I order enough books that there's a box, the cats get excited about the box. So there's yeah. like a mutual excitement. Okay. Maybe it's dof- different things. Right. But they're happy. I'm happy. It's wonderful. Yeah. When it comes in just an envelope, they're not as excited. No. So I am alone yeah. in that excitement. Yeah. Yeah. So there needs to be some kind of better fanfare. Yes. Mm-hmm. But one that's not going to make us pee our pants. Yes. Agreed. Mm-hmm. I guess if it's good enough, though, I'll just be prepared and wear special underwear that day in case I'm going to pee my pants. I mean, I'm willing to do that just to be able to unbox something super exciting. Maybe at this point we should just be wearing those underwear all the time probably. anyway, because, you know, smart. like, I mean, just a sneeze and there yeah. you go. Yeah, yeah, things are over. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. You get the real stuff when you listen to us. Yes, yeah, That's you do. what's happening I'm right filtered. now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Well, it sounds wonderful. It I'm is. glad that uh, I, I would like to borrow that as well. I brought I, it for you. Fantastic. Mm-hmm. Who knows when I get to it? You know how it is. I know. I know. When but it's, it's a already nice... been read. It sounds wonderful. It is. It's and I good. was excited we were going to get that for free. Free. Because we're awesome. Free. Legit. Legit. Too legit. We have a website. To quit. <laughs> <laughs> we That's have a website. still one of my funniest thoughts of you. Because I was watching our live episode, and when you say, listen, we're legit. We have a website. <laughs> and I just lost it. I lost it again watching it. It's like, that's, because, see, this is this is an example of how you're funny. The definition of legitimacy is having a website. Because no one can make one, <laughs> just to be no clear. One, it is not 2021 Mm-mm. with, you know, easy-made websites anywhere. No, no. If you have a le- website, I can't even say that you're for sure legit. Because I, <laughs> there are... Websites I can think of right now that are not. So by extension, because I manage our website, I am super legit. Yes, yes. So you are legit. the chief legitimacy officer, <laughs> CLO. I like that. I'm gonna run with that. Okay, good. Chief legitimacy officer, terrific. So <laughs> I want you to say that in a meeting somewhere, but in. In very serious tone and just see if anyone's like, oh. I also want to try it at my actual job where I am not, my title is not a chief in any way. <laughs> just call it out. Just add it to your email. Just signature. add it. Yeah. Chief legitimacy officer. <laughs> I'll be like, wait, did we make that title? How, where did that come I from? I don't want to ask. That'll make it look like I don't know what's going on. Exactly. And then all of a sudden you are. And then I am. The chief I'm legitimacy. The chief legit- <laughs> Then you can just start saying, shouldn't I be at that meeting as the chief legitimacy officer? But I don't want to go to more meetings, so no. I don't want that part. No. Okay. Yeah. Well, shouldn't I make more money because I'm the chief legitimacy <laughs> that, officer? Hell yeah. I was told yeah. that I was going to get a raise that would be effective this month for that new position, <laughs> chief lit- legitimacy officer. I really like your tactic in corporate culture is just, yeah. uh, you know, barreling forward, mm-hmm. stating things definitively, mm-hmm. and because no one will be, you know, brave enough to question it, it's going to happen. Mm-hmm. You get it. Yeah. That's how it works. That's how you succeed right there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Okay. So other genre books. Yes. I have a memoir for us. Ooh. It is called Fairest. It came out last year. It's from Meredith Tallison. Okay. And Meredith was born as a boy in the Philippines, uh, a boy with albinism. Mm. She was called a sun child. And because her skin is so fair, like almost white looking, she was viewed with this sort of like jealousy and admiration and resentment because, of course, we've exported our white is best philosophy right. all around the world. Mm-hmm. Right. So we get this picture in the book. We get this picture of Meredith's childhood complete. She was a child actor. So we get a whole little insight into Philippine uh, acting oh, culture wow. there. Her obsession with Leah Salonga from Miss Saigon, which... I admit I was also obsessed. Yeah. Um, And then she moves to the U.S. where she is viewed as white. She gets an academic scholarship to Harvard. And suddenly she's in these super rarefied circles, right? Like just money and craziness. And and she looks white. So she's accepted as part of that. Um, Meredith also knows at that time that she's gay and begins to explore the world as this very white looking, very beautiful gay man who is highly desired, highly privileged. So she's just getting this whole experience that 
maybe she wouldn't have got back home. But as time passes and she becomes an artist and activist, she starts questioning a lot of things more, including gender. Mm. She at the time, she's in a very loving relationship as a gay man, but she feels sort of trapped in a sense. And ultimately, she decides that she doesn't fully identify as a man. So she transitions to become a woman, even though she's risking this great love that she has. She realizes this is too important and she has to do it. Right. So this is such a rich and beautifully told story. And the way that Meredith talks about the intersections of race and class and sexuality, that's why I chose it for this theme. Mm -hmm. I think uh, Meredith understands early on, because of her albinism, that she's seen as white. But because she's actually Filipina, she gets an almost behind-the-scenes view of racial prejudice which is a a very interesting view that she then gives on. And for a while, she uses her perceived whiteness and how she's viewed by straight and gay. It gives her this privilege. Mm -hmm. Even when she transitions to be a woman, there's a level of given privilege still because, you know, the way she looks the way she does, unless she identifies herself as an immigrant and an Asian person. Mm -hmm. So this is such a unique take. The story itself is phenomenal Mm -hmm. but that view of sort of looking behind the scenes almost (laughs) I think of it almost as like a spy like a spy behind the front lines you know Mm -hmm. and seeing what it's really like back there um exposes really our hypocriticalness just as a society and especially in those circles themselves so interesting wow yeah that sounds really good it was very good she's a phenomenal writer um I've heard her talk about the book too and read parts of the book and yeah, she's great. I like that pick, especially yeah. for this theme. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. I I just kept thinking about what it would be like, like us as white women, what if somehow we were able to sneak behind the enemy lines and, yeah. and exist in the white male space and see what it's really like back there. You yeah. Know, we have suspicions, we have ideas, but to be able to do that, and it feels like in some ways she almost felt like she had that experience yeah. because of this sort of outward appearance appearance that she had. yeah yeah that's kind of amazing mm-hmm. cool well i this book you need to read it now because oh. it's coming out as a movie in may of 2021 oh. which i've been waiting years for this because oh it was published in 2017 okay. which is around the time i believe i read it but this book above suspicion an undercover fbi agent an illicit affair and a murder of passion by Whoa. joe sharkey yes yes okay so it's 1987 and Mark Putnam is a rising star in the FBI. He is killing it. I am picturing a mustache. You should. I am picturing some high hair. Yep. I have got a look in my head. Good. Okay. Stick with that. Yeah. Okay. So he draws a new post because he gets a promotion. And it's kind of a mixed bag. He gets Pikeville, Kentucky. And it is a promotion, but moving to Appalachian Coal Country is not exactly his desired situation. Mm-hmm. So he's going to move his family there. He's married. He takes it in stride, and soon he's working the angles. He's got paid informants. He is, like, making a name for himself. He's busting drug rings, and they have some really long-standing robbery circles in this area where the community is so tight-knit that they won't turn on each other, even when they know crimes are being committed. So they have such a distrust of anybody in any kind of police force that they won't rat each other out essentially Mm -hmm. so they've had a lot of robberies and strings especially bank robberies that they have gone unsolved not necessarily because the bank robbers were great but just because no one was willing to either testify or say Mm. yeah that was the person so he's starting to be successful in breaking this and getting some people to flip so he's getting a lot of attention he's doing a great job one of those informants susan smith it turns out to be a little more than an informant for him and pretty soon we're in a tale of betrayal crime and who can art outsmart who Ooh. so this is for a true crime read super propulsive uh the author does a great job of telling both the story of mark and susan in a way that they feel very real and accessible to the reader so even if you don't agree with their actions you feel connected to them and you feel for them and you sort of understand why they're each making the decisions that they're making. And he does a really good job of giving you a lot of background. I mean, you really get to know these characters leading up to the story and then through what happens after. Um, And really, this book could just be called Hypocrite Junction (laughs) because, I mean... (laughs) What else do is you Is that got? what the movie is calling it? I, it should be, okay. Hypocrite Junction, because yeah. uh-huh. really no one's doing what they say they're going to do, <laughs> and everybody's betraying everyone. And Ooh. 
We all live at Hypocrite Junction. I mean, that should be the uh, name of the country, maybe? Yeah. You know? Like our like a tagline for the country. Yeah. Like if we had a, you know, branded, <laughs> some sort of branding for USA. the United States of America. Hypocrite, Hypocrite Junction, Junction, what's your function? <laughs> Hooking up opposite ideas and calling them bad. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. It's great, though. Really, truly. I... I can't even remember where I saw it and ended up picking it up. And I thought, wow, this is really good. And then I found out it was being made into a movie. And this movie, I don't, it has been a long time coming because they said it was originally. And then I'm not sure what happened. And then some of the actors changed. And now. So it's a movie and not a documentary. It's a movie. Yeah. Ooh. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And is it like, so it's a, it's a movie, not a, sh- sorry, I keep harping on this, not a show. <laughs> No, I don't know a, why I can't quite wrap my head around this today. It's also a movie, not a play. <laughs> it's also a movie and not, not a book, a, not a musical. <laughs> okay. Not a musical. Okay. All right. Thank you for yeah. helping me not through that. Not a pop, prop up street <laughs> dance. It's it's a movie. <laughs> it's not a flash mob. No, it's not okay. A flash mob. <laughs> I said pop up street dance. You did, which I like that. <laughs> Just in case flash mob was copyrighted, I wasn't right. sure. <laughs> Oh, it's a movie. So this is a movie film. With actors. With actors. And a producer. Where is it coming out at? I I think it has a theater release, oh, okay. but I'm not okay. entirely sure. I couldn't really get that information. Okay. I don't know if they're maybe not sure. COVID is And now of... I'm just calling it Hypocrite Junction in my head. So what's the actual <laughs> name again? Above <laughs> Suspicion. <laughs> oh, my God. Can we make a movie called Hypocrite Junction? Yes. Yes, please. Okay, good. Yeah. Because... That's a that's a gold mine right yeah. there. Yeah. It feels great. <laughs> Hypocrite Junction. Oh boy. We'd have some stories for it. It feels like something that would be on SNL. It really does. Like a kid's show that would be on yeah. SNL. Yeah. Hypocrite Junction. <laughs> I watch every week SNL, so if you steal it, I'm gonna expect some oh, writing. Man, credit. yeah. <laughs> or at least inviting us to the show. Yeah. The least, least you, can, you do. can do. Yeah. The least you can do. <laughs> to be clear, this is also not a sketch comedy show. It's a movie. <laughs> not an animated cartoon. <laughs> Which I can see how calling it Hypocrite Junction might have made you think that it was animated. I think we just hit my level for the week of brain activity. Like, it's just done. <laughs> it's over. We're done. We're out. Couldn't understand what a movie was. <laughs> there we go. I don't know why I'm harping on this, but it's not a show, right? <laughs> No, nope. oh, oh okay. sure isn't. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I guess it depends on what you call movies. Some people say, I'm going to a show. <laughs> it's a piece of cinema. It's a c- not a show. <laughs> it's a piece of cinematic. I don't know what word to put after cinematic. <laughs> oh. All right, well. Okay. <laughs> Was it a movie? <laughs> no, it's a show. It's a show. <laughs> Hot dog. <laughs> and it's a show you've seen, Erin. Oh. So you got to okay. you gotta pitch in here, too. Hit me with it. It is a show called The Sinner. Oh. Three seasons. Oh, so, yeah. All on Netflix. Yes. And each season is a different story with one detective that's on each case, played by Bill Pullman, who's fantastic. He's amazing in this. This show oh my gosh. is intense. It is. So the first season, we meet Jessica Beale who is a young mom with her son and husband at the beach. And this group of people are seated near them, and they're playing this song on their phone or whatever, and something just happens. She snaps, and she takes the knife that she was using to pare an apple and stabs one of the young men a bunch of times, and he dies from murder. (laughs) (laughs) Or stab wounds. (laughs) Dies from murder. Oh man! Whew. Okay, I really want us to have a murder <laughs> mystery party now, and you to just walk in and say he died of murder. <laughs> Whew. Okay. So yeah, murder. Okay. <laughs> so it seems pretty open and shut, right? Like she's admitting to what she did, 
But the detective, like right away, he thinks that something's off. So he probes a little bit and she he probes on the story and she gets confused and she starts having all these memories that she didn't really think about or or understand before. And over the season, we see that her strict, very strict religious upbringing and a dangerous ex involve or start, you know, making sense of Mm -hmm. the whole situation. And you may think you know where it's going. You don't. You don't. The second season, we meet a young boy who poisons his parents. So we learn that they're not his parents. They're actually Mm -hmm. members of a commune Mm -hmm. like him. And we meet the head lady who is Carrie Coon. So good. Always fantastic. Always good. And we dive into what is actually a cult. Surprise. The common's a cult. (laughs) Tale as old as time. (laughs) And then the third season, there is Matt Bomer Mm -hmm. and Chris. What is his last name? I didn't write it down. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Chris Messina. Mm -hmm. Two heavenly men. Yes. Who, these are two old friends who reconnect, and one of them ends up dead, and the other starts going cuckoo. Real cuckoo. Cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. It's so good. Just overall, this show is so gripping. It's so twisty. And it's not just twisty for twisty's sake. You know, it's not just like trying to mess with you or anything. It's each season we're learning what makes these people tick, how they may have come to this place of murder, and how it's never just a simple, like, who done it, you know? And in fact, it takes society to task, I, I think, for a lot of the things that we do to people that bring them to this place. And that's mm-hmm. why I chose it for this theme. Mm-hmm. I think the title itself, you know, The Sinner, those of us who grew up in at least a little religion can picture what that might mean, mm-hmm. but it's never simple. Like Jessica Beale's character, for example, in the first season, would she have killed if her parents didn't indoctrinate her with all this horrific guilt and skewed responsibility? Mm-hmm. Or the kid in season two, the things that he's taught at this cult slash commune, mm-hmm. he thinks he's doing the right thing. Mm-hmm. Or Matt Bomer, he sees hypocrites all around and he's trying to do something different and maybe making it worse. Mm-hmm. So it's so deep. There's phenomenal performances by everyone involved. So good. Like I said, you never quite know where it's going. And there's so much to think about and examine. Mm-hmm. What would you add, Erin? I, I don't know if I can add anything. That is it. That it You just don't know where it's going and it's yeah. so good. Every bit of it. And I'll admit that I hesitated on watching this for a while because I had some sort of like thought about Jessica Biel not being a good actress. And I was wrong. Yeah, no, I was she, dead wrong. I don't amazing. know where that came from. Mm-hmm. But somehow I had that in my head and I was a fool. It's real good. It's real good. And what's really fun is that it's one of those where that storyline is wrapped up in that season. Yes. So you move on to a different, like you mentioned, different storyline, but you kind of get that satisfaction of finding out the whole thing within right. that episode. Or and the, that the one character, season. the detective, you know, following yes. through, you see his sort of evolution and yeah. devolution in a way. Like yeah. he goes through some stuff. He does. And he, yeah, he's just gripping himself he is so good that was a good pick for this all right well i picked a docu-series so not a cinema no it's not a cinematic feature (laughs) it's a docu-series okay okay. it's a six-part docu-series whoa yes it's on hbo max so welcome back oh there it is yep it's called q into the storm oh no yeah this was the show where i was just like i can't handle this right now i (laughs) I can't do it and i Okay, so this is a uh, a documentary made by Colin Hoback, and Adam McKay was one of the executive producers who did Succession and some other Mm -hmm. things. But Colin spends three years in the making on this. And to be clear, he had no idea when he started, like, where it was going to go with the election. He didn't know that we would all know what QAnon is. Right, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He was just trying to figure out, like, what is this? Why is it playing a role? Where did it start? And I'll admit that I didn't really know much about it other than we heard a lot about yeah. it leading up to the election and you've heard the things that they believe in Pizzagate things like that and so you're like what is this where did this start and so that's his whole goal is he's going to try to get to the bottom of the QAnon movement and it takes him every possible place you can imagine a large part of this is actually shot in the Philippines um, because there is a father son Jim Watkins and Ron Watkins who were basically the hosts of the web program that allowed QAnon to get off the ground. So if you're unfamiliar, which I am I'm was very ignorant to all of this. So 
QAnon, just the basics of it, is that there is an agent Q Mm -hmm. who is very, very close to the president. And by president, I mean, I'm referring to Trump in Mm -hmm. this situation. Um, He was very, very close to him and he would do anonymous. He considered himself anonymous. So it was Q Anon. Um, And he would do these drops. They would call them Q drops on these forums and say, this is going to happen. And they would seem to come true or there would be like, coincidental things that you could say, ooh, this seems about right. Now, like a lot of these kind of things, conspiracy theories, they had to go somewhere. You have to be hosted somewhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, it started out on a different board, and then it became 8chan. And the guy that kind of created 4chan basically ended up selling the idea and going into business with Ron and Jim Watkins. And then this is where QAnon really took off. Now, where QAnon's downfall was, was that A-Chan is also the place where, I mean, it gets nutty. And, like, there was quite a few mass shootings where people kind of said what they were going to do beforehand on there. So you'll see that whole evolution, too. But basically, he just digs and digs and digs and keeps digging to find out, well, how did you get in? What do you think? Who is Q? He's kind of using this as the question the whole time. So I don't... It is weird. And it's twisty and it's frightening. So don't mistake what I'm going to say is that I'm not terrified because mm-hmm. I am. But it also helped me feel a little bit better because <laughs> when you get to the end of the six series and you think, dear Lord, people bought into that and that's who that was and that's how this was done. And there's a part of you that thinks that's really scary that they got that many people to just go nuts on this idea. But then on the flip side, it's also a little bit refreshing that it wasn't like a, in my head, I was figuring it was like a terrorist operative. Yeah. Like, and it's very different than you think. It goes a very different So direction. they actually identify they who do. it is. He won't admit it, but you pretty much, you know, at the oh. end, pretty much exactly where it started. And that's kind of confirmed by things that happen post. Um, this documentary goes up into January 6th. At oh the my Capitol. gosh. He was there. The documentary filmmaker was there. Oh, wow. Filming. And so it goes right up until that. And you're sort of left, you know, basically. So, yeah. um, like, I, it was fascinating. It's just really interesting. It's not a side of the world that I really understood mm-hmm. prior to this. I also didn't understand how anyone could believe the things that they believe. And watching how people made those mental gymnastics was fascinating. Um, it was fascinating to see how much people were willing to lose on this idea that this is the truth. This is it. And it kind of leaves you with the feeling like, which is an overall question for our political system in general, is that there's just a lot of people that are disenfranchised and looking for something to believe yes. in. Looking for someone who's something not a hypocrite, anything, yeah. who's willing to step up and say, no, this is this is the right thing to do in this situation. Yeah. Now, am I saying that those people... No, that's all very misguided. But... Yeah, it was it was interesting. It's weird. It took a lot of places and it is just rife with hypocrites. Like mm. they're saying one thing and the very next minute it's another. Like uh, and we all know this from some of the beliefs about yeah. QAnon. But like one of them that really struck me was th- one of the things that got Q really fired up was when Jeffrey Epstein was arrested. Yeah. They were like, "Oh, the storm's coming. This is it. This is what he said he was going to do. He's going to take down all the pedophiles in Hollywood." Oh so Jeffrey my God. Epstein is the tip of this. Just seemingly ignoring the fact that he was friends with Trump and that Trump had connections yeah. to him. Yeah. They just know Trump was doing, that's why Trump was friends with him because this is his, oh, this was good his God. big goal. He was going to take down this whole pedophile ring. So this is the start. Jeffrey Epstein's the start. And then they were like a little disappointed because nothing else happened. Yeah. And then he was killed. But was he killed? You know, like it, so then it spins into another place. And that's like how everything is. Like they set these deadlines, like this is what's going to happen. And then it doesn't happen. And they're like, well, it's because of this. That's like every apocalyptic cult ever. Uh It is. It's very, and it is so interesting to watch the infighting in the group, which you get a lot of people that made a bajillion dollars podcasting about it or becoming a YouTuber about it. And then they would kind of dig in and be like, well, I don't believe it anymore because this person got popular and that's not true. And this, and then once they got out of it, they'd say, well, yeah, this doesn't make sense anymore now that I look at it. And but oh the, the amount of hypocrisy that they were willing to jump through to say, one of the big things with QAnon is this freedom of speech, because that's, that's really at the heart of, a lot of this documentary is 
8chan. Is that is something like that allowed to exist on the internet? What responsibility do we have? Mm-hmm. And and I don't think it answers that. And I don't honestly, I don't think anyone can answer that right now. I mean, as humans, we're living in an age. This is all new. Yeah. So we're trying to figure that out. And yeah, there are free speech issues. But you're talking about people that are talking about that. But then on the other side want, you know, mainstream media to go away. They shouldn't be allowed to speak. Right. So there's a lot of... So much hypocrisy in that. that Yes. No connection on the ideas at all. And fighting for a free speech, what what does that mean exactly? You know, in what context do you want it to be? So you're going to meet some characters that you're like, holy buckets. You're going to have moments where you're like, this makes no sense. You're going to have moments where you think, okay, I don't, how could you believe that? How mm-hmm. could this guy be the head of it? And this is what they believe, but this is what he does in his everyday life. Do you think life. people within the, you know, it's not really an organization, in the it belief kind of, system, yeah. um, do they agree on who it is? Yes and no. Okay. Although there's so much secrecy around it. And, and I the think, infighting, maybe. Yeah, yeah, and I think the people at the top, maybe, but the people that the people that we see, the people that were going to rallies, the yeah. people that were outside, the people that are getting interviewed that have been on taken CNN, advantage of, and yes, and I don't think that they have any idea even where this started. Because yeah. if you did, you would have questions about why such a patriotic movement isn't even based in the United States. It's based <laughs> in the Philippines. It's not here. So there's things that I think that they don't know. I okay. think that they truly believe still that it's someone close to Trump who is doing this, if not Trump himself. And there were, I mean, they go down the road, was it Steve Bannon? And they kind of dismem, you know, like dismember, uh, disavow all that, like kind of help explain why mm-hmm. that doesn't work. Um, they sh- take you through posts, the drops, and show you like, this is how people decided that it was Trump because of this comment or this thing. There's a lot of evidence to say that regardless of whether someone was close he was watching and realized that that was a base that he could use for sure um there were things on boards that were like oh it'd be so cool if president trump could work this word Mm -hmm. into his speech and then he would or it'd be cool if he could do this in a tweet and misspell this word with a q instead of a g and he would and so there's a lot i mean there's a lot and and like they say you know the minute that you believe one conspiracy theory you basically believe you're them open all. to all of them absolutely yeah. so, and i think uh it, it sounds like the you know the people the underlings whatever you want to call them the believers i think like we said a couple of weeks ago they're confusing coincidence with conspiracy yes. and yeah. once you go down that road yeah like everything is open and mm-hmm. everything is a conspiracy. and they'll all tell you they don't believe in coincidence of course there is not. no coincidence right. everything's on purpose everything's for a purpose mm-hmm. so and some of the leaps that they make are just you're like oh my gosh but it feels like there's been a concerted effort over the last like 20 years within organized religion, within politics to set that up, to mm-hmm. make it OK for people to make these giant le- leaps or for, you know, the the belief systems in place that allow that, mm-hmm. encourage it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it, it really brings up. There's other discussions in there, like you've mentioned before, um, the podcast that you listen to about the guy that went down the YouTube yeah, rabbit hole. And they yeah. talk about that, that, you know, A-chan really became the face of like, this is the problem. But no one was talking about that. Actually, some of these, um, one of the gunmen in particular that committed a mass shooting gave way more YouTube. credit to YouTube yeah. than he did mm-hmm. anything else. So it's, I don't know, it's really interesting. And it, it, it'll get the wheels turning. And it's not as... Um, off-putting as I thought it was going to okay. be. It's more interesting and it's yeah. more just informational. And like I said, at the end, I kind of got there and thought, huh, I don't know if I should be, but I feel a little less afraid now <laughs> because somehow that doesn't <laughs> seem quite... Well, you know. maybe that's good. I think I have been too afraid to watch it because it is such a scary idea that all of these people are believing these mm-hmm. things. They're just wackadoodle mm-hmm. and taking it to such levels such as storming the Capitol. Where do we go from there? Well, I tell you where we're not going to go. <laughs> where we go one, we capital? don't go oh, all. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, just kidding. We're going to be back next Wednesday, but without kind of like a weird... I, I would hope so. Political uprising. Of yeah, people. no, I don't want to do that. No. Like I have, you know, visions for the podcast and one of them is not overthrowing the government. No, it's not. I no. don't want I to do that. I would love to have like rabid fans. Oh, sure. But but I'm not, I don't want. I don't want leadership. That sounds terrible. No. I don't want anything to do no, with that. So, no, you know, you no. fans that are pushing us in that direction, just stop it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I forgot to say one thing. Oh. Okay. Do 
the the horns, the guy oh, with no the shirt and with the horns. horns. Yeah. yeah. That means something, right? After the Capitol insurrection, yeah. we all know that picture. Yep. Cameos all over in that. Oh. Like, you're like, oh, my God, that's the guy with the horn. Yeah. So he's in it. Okay. He's in it. Okay. Mm-hmm. Did you recognize him without the horns or does he's, he wear he's the only horns? He's in it with the horns. He's only yeah, yeah, with yeah. the horns. Okay. Yeah. It's towards the end. And you're like, what? And hmm. then you're like, oh, there okay. he is. Because I know none of us got enough of that. Oh, boy. Is he in jail now? <laughs> like, I, I feel so. like we need to keep an eye on that one. Oh, I think so. Yeah. Okay, good. Was he one of the ones like his ex-girlfriends turned him into FBI? Because that I couldn't get enough of that. I hope so. I hope that so. I didn't terrific. follow his trajectory enough, yeah. to be honest. <laughs> I was just like, wow, that's a... Bold statement. It's a bold statement. Bold yeah. move, Cotton. Bold move. <laughs> is that his name? <laughs> no. Oh. It's from Dodgeball. Uh, okay. <laughs> bold move, Cotton. <laughs> <laughs> like you're on first name basis with the guy at the horse? <laughs> his name could be Cotton. Okay. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> and it's not a bold move. It was just dumb. No. That's yeah. very dumb. I don't want to confuse any kind of bravery or good word like no. bold with. Yeah. Good call. That. Don't do that. That was just that was ignorant. Poor word choice. Yeah. Learn from your mistakes. Do the work, Aaron. I will. I'm going to spend this week doing the work. And then next week we'll be back and I'll be a better human. Great. Yes. And until then, happy reading. <laughs>